Hi, and welcome back to my Dallas Cowboys blog. It's been a bit since I posted, and there's been a lot of shocking news since then. Uh, not yet the draft, so let's recount the turbulent spring so far. DeMarcus Ware, I'm in shock about it. I'm still in complete shock. Um, even though it's been like a week since Cowboys cut him, uh, he's one of the best players to ever play his position. A real blue chip player that offenses had to respond to. Dallas couldn't get it done with him. Um, I'm really bummed about that. However, I have to admit that in this very blog, I brought up that his deal was a huge issue. He ended up getting even more money on the open market than he would have gotten in Dallas. I love d but I think I'm over it. I've been constantly glad we ditched the 3-4, and this is part of the price. I have wondered if Marinelli saw every holdover player on this defensive roster as needing change, and it's possible that he did this, and this is what we've seen. Jason Hatcher made some money for himself. I'm only happy for him, and I really just don't dread him in a 3-4. I understand to a degree why Washington paid him so much to play that dueling, that dulling position. I think he was only very good. He was the only very good 5-tech on the market. Uh, while in contrast, Harry Melton will play the 3, Jason Hatcher offers 3 solid positions. Um... From what I understand, his deal is practically a two-year deal. Now that Washington has paid their cap penalty, they probably have some dough to spend. DeMarcus Ware came into the NFL as the 11th pick in the draft, pre-rookie cap. In Dallas, he got about three contracts before going to Denver. I know financially he's probably the most successful Dallas Cowboy defender of all time. When you think about he had a, a second year, a second deal, and then a third contract. Uh, Julius Peppers came into the NFL with an amazing NFL-ready physique, and he was a number two overall pick in the draft. He, too, has amassed, amassed an amazing amount of money uh, with each second and third round, third contract. I bring this up because I wonder where the money is for Jared Allen. He came into the NFL as a fourth rounder, and I wonder if they hold that against him. Unlike Pepper and Ware, uh, I only see Allen as a weak side end. The other two players have enormous size. They're both like 6'4", 6 6'5", 6 and can play multiple positions. While Jared Allen, I, I think he's also he's also tall, but he seems to be pigeonholed into the 4'3". Uh, I've never, it's never hindered Allen, but it seems like it's hurting his money. Um, the only reason Jared Allen isn't getting an enormous amount of money now, as I see it, is because he wasn't a first round pick. Uh, so Dallas has radically changed their face of their defense. If Sean Lee is healthy, it's probably his face. Maybe Morris Claiborne will deliver, and it could be Morris Claiborne's face. Uh, all this hits home that the clock is ticking on Romo and Witten. We just cut to Marcus Ware. He's my favorite player. I am really disappointed that it ended like that for, for Ware, and that he didn't win a Super Bowl while he was in Dallas, um, and that Dallas didn't win a Super Bowl with him. And I've been glad that Dallas ditched the 3-4 all this time, Yet, um, to admit that that whole chapter of Dallas Cowboy history is now completely useless uh, is disappointing. I really thought we would at least take some of the best players from that period and that they would be our heroes that would carry us to a title. Um, but it's not going to happen, and it didn't happen. I put a lot of stock. Uh, so I, uh, I had a comment on CowboysNation.com. That's one of my favorite blogs. And uh, it's about the short shuttle times for defensive linemen, especially regards to edge rushers. And so I'll just copy myself verbatim. I put a lot of stock in the short shuttle times for edge rushers. This list of times is amazing. Uh, no one is topping Von Miller or DeMarcus Ware in this list, but the number of large men with short shuttles below 4.5 is enormous. Normally there's only three or four defensive line players with 4.4 short shuttles. This year there are nine. To cross-reference uh, Jeff Jackson, uh, so I got a bunch of numbers, got a bunch of times. Um, there's a lot of people that had sub 4-4 four, four short shuttles, including Aaron Donaldson, who, uh, or Aaron Donald, who's the defensive lineman from Pittsburgh, expected to play um, a three-tech. Uh, Dallas Cowboys are still interested in him, with her even with Melton being signed in Dallas. You would still think uh, Aaron Donald could end up in Dallas thing is, I'm starting to think Aaron Donald might go in the top 10. He looks like an amazing defensive lineman, someone you could really build your franchise around, and I don't see him really coming to Dallas because I think he'll go much higher now. 
I found this, you know, whenever you're in the middle of the draft and you start falling in love with players, those players tend to rise, and so then you have to find new players to really like. Um, so that's just how it goes. So with his 4.39 short shuttle, it's possible that Aaron Donald uh, could produce as an edge rusher in the NFL. As an interior lineman, Donald and Hagman offer some all-time sideline-to-sideline speed. Well, to be true, I think that was hyperbolic. I don't know that it's true that uh, Donald and Hagman offer all-time sideline-to-sideline speed. But one thing I was thinking about when I was watching Donald and I was watching Hagman is they reminded me of the Manster from the 70s Cowboys. And he had remarkable sideline-to-sideline speed for an interior defensive lineman. He was... When they drafted him, they actually played him at middle linebacker. Uh, imagine a guy playing Sean Lee's position. So that's the middle of the field, and he's going all over the place. Uh, but instead, he got more productivity when they actually put him in the defensive line. So it's crazy to put that kind of speed there. And the Manster was a defense, definitive defensive player of the 70s. Um, I don't believe they really play his position anymore. The 4-3 that... Uh, Tom Landry invented is completely out of date in the modern NFL. It involved a lot of features you can't do anymore. I'm not even sure it's legal. Uh, stuff like a defensive tackle lining a half yard off the line of scrimmage. Um, some of that stuff's just not done anymore. I don't know if there's a role for a player like the Manster um, quite like he had in his time. I'm sure if you were a great athlete like him, you would find success in some role. Um, and I believe that Aaron Donald is going to have that kind of success. I'm starting to think what I'm getting at here, I guess, is that Donald's going to rise. He's out of draft reach for the Cowboys. If he falls to the Cowboys, I believe he's the kind of player you can build your whole defense around. And I would glad, I would be very happy if they drafted him. All right, so I had some fun and I ran some mock draft simulators. And I wanted to go over them and my results and talk about my uh, thoughts and strategies and why I picked these players. And so draft number one, in the first round, I picked wide receiver Sammy Watkins from Clemson. So a wide receiver in the first round. In the second round, Coney Ely fell to me in the second round, and I gladly picked him. In the third round, I picked offensive tackle Jack Muhort of Ohio State. Um, third round, offensive tackle from Ohio State. In the fourth round, I got defensive tackle Daquan Jones from Penn State. And in the fifth round, I got Jeremy Hill from LSU. He's a running back. He's about 230 pounds. And so everything went right here in this first mock draft. Sammy Watkins freakishly fell to me. I didn't anticipate drafting a wide receiver, but he was too good. He'll take over Miles Austin's role opposite Des Bryant. Terrence Williams is a really good player. He's even more dangerous as a slot receiver than he is as the edge. And that's where we'll keep him. So I also found Jack Muhort in the third round. He looks like a good right tackle in the making. Jeremy Hill is a 230-pound running back. The wide receiver is a surprise at the top, but the rest of this draft is about big linemen and a big running back. And it really all fell my way. Coney Ely in the second round, two miracles to start the draft early. That wide receiver is elite. He falls to me. Coney Ely falls to me in the second round. Daquan Jones is my number one. I mean, he's actually going to play the one on my defensive line. Big guy. Uh, gets gets into the backfield. A lot of speed. Very happy to get him. So I have um, a starter on my weak side. And uh, I have a starter on my wide receiver core. I have Jack Muhort, who will compete at tackle and maybe, uh, maybe push Doug Free to guard, something like that. Uh, Jeremy Hill is going to offer a really big running back to complement DeMarco Murray. Um, so draft number two was more difficult. I didn't have such easy choices because no great players immediately fell to me. Um, and so I had to trust my board and operate that way. I got good players all the way. And then, in my opinion, a really ridiculous option in the fifth round. Uh, so I got Taylor Lawan. Offensive tackle from Michigan in the first round. Uh, Scott Crichton, defensive end from Oregon State in uh, the second round. Carlos Hyde, my running back from Ohio State in the third round. Fourth round, Justin Ellis, Louisiana Tech, defensive tackle. And in the fifth round, defensive end Jeff Co Jeff Jackson Jeffcoat, uh, University of Texas. 
So you notice in each of these drafts, I pick a 230-pound running back. I didn't want to get Carlos Hyde, but he was the best player available in the third round. He's a one-cut runner who would excel behind his own line, like the Denver teams of the early 2000s. He's also 230 pounds and can be hard on a defense. Dallas is using a zone scheme these days when they run. It can be hard to tell exactly what scheme an offense runs when they're blocking. Um, everything is hybridized, but it is something that a one-cut runner could excel at. And so he's similar to DeMarco Murray, but he offers a different combination of size and speed. It would really um, complement uh, Lance Dunbar, is our very fast running back. And then we have DeMarco Murray, who's a mid-sized, powerful running back. And then we would have Carlos Hyde, who's a very powerful, very large running back. That would be a formidable collection of running backs. Justin Ellis was an interesting choice. I also had Anthony Johnson, a defensive tackle of LSU, available. Both players have outstanding quickness and snap anticipation, but Justin Ellis is a comfortable 334 pounds, while Johnson is 308 pounds. Dallas really needs at least one player well over 300 pounds, so I see Ellis as a long-term solution at the one. So Justin Ellis, a much bigger player, and for that reason, I have him over Anthony Johnson uh, when I was I had the option to draft both of them. And in both cases, Justin Ellis, Anthony Johnson, there were also other defensive tackles on the board that were available, but those defensive tackles either projected more as five techs, so they're like six foot five or six foot six, and they're 285 pounds. So they're very big, but they're lean. Uh, they're a lean sort of large. Instead, I'm looking for 334 pounds, as in the case of Justin Ellis. Um, I would have taken Anthony Johnson if Justin Ellis wasn't there. Because Anthony Johnson is 308 pounds, he's also very fast, he has a quick reaction time. But I read about Justin Ellis using a swim move, I read about Justin Ellis using a spin move. We're talking about a 335 pound dude spinning in the middle of a scrum and making a play. And I like that kind of athleticism and I like to combine with his poundage, that's going to make it hard to run against him. And so that's why I drafted him over Anthony Johnson. And I actually drafted him ahead of several other defensive tackles. But those guys weren't even on my map. Anthony Johnson was. But those other guys weren't considered fast enough. Or they were really kind of five techs. They weren't really 4-3 kind of players. Uh, so Jackson Jeffcoat was there in the fifth round. Which is actually kind of preposterous. He's a first round pick. His combine cemented that. The best short shuttle of the defensive line in the combine. When I drafted him, though, I ended up with two players I project as weak side defensive ends. Scott Crichton is also a weak side defensive end. I don't like drafting two players to literally the same role, but both players were too good to pass when they were taken. I currently project Selvi as reigning Dallas weak side defensive end, but he'll go back to strong side, and Jeff Coat and Crichton would start on the weak side. The two rookies would rotate at defensive end on the weak side. That would be my plan going forward. That's actually kind of harsh, and a lot to ask of young players. Weak side defensive end is like the Des Bryant of defense. His presence makes every other more, every other player effective. Well, we say Marinelli can coach him up. These guys have athletic talent. Let's put it together. I didn't think twice about taking a tackle in the first round or drafting a running back in the third. I want to see smash mouth offense, and that's how it's done. All right, draft number two didn't get a wide receiver, but it gave us the intriguing prospect of Jeff Coat in the fifth round. All right, this is my last draft. Since you saved the results, sorry, right. <laughs> my last my last mock draft number three. I call this one "Faith in God, Except No Tight Ends." All right, so I'm going to totally roll off my board, except unless a tight end is actually ranked above anyone else, because then I won't draft them. No tight ends. All right, so in the first round, Teddy Bridgewater fell to me. I drafted him. In the second round. Wide receiver Odell Beckham fell to me, and I drafted him. I took Jackson Jeffcoat in the third round for the reasons I mentioned before. I consider him a first-round prospect now. Daquan Jones, defensive tackle from Penn State. I consider him very desirable. He's my one-tech. Kareem Martin, North Carolina, in the fifth round. I don't believe Kareem Martin will be there in the fifth round anymore, but it's hard to say. More on that later. 
I didn't expect to take a quarterback, but Teddy is a great valuable, and he was there at pick 16. We just cut DeMarcus Ware, and Tony Romo isn't going to last forever. He doesn't help us tomorrow, though. In the second round, I didn't expect to go and, again, take a skill position player, but Odell Beckham was too good of a value. He was the right assets. He has the right assets to line up os- opposite Des Bryant and slice up NFL defenses. Again, Terrence Williams would line up in the slot. Unlike Teddy Bridgewater, this draft pick helps us today. I've had some faith in that the beef, the lineman, would be available in later rounds. So when I took these two skill position players on offense in the set, in the first and the second, and I did a quarterback that I don't even expect to start ahead of Tony Romo. I have to have some confidence and faith that in the third and later rounds there's going to be some linemen. All right, so in the third round, I saw Jackson Jeffcoat. This time, you see how I value him. I see him as an electric outside linebacker prospect and a very good Dwight Freeney type of defensive end. And so for Dallas, I don't know that Jeffcoat is big enough combined with his speed to warrant a Dallas selection at 16, but he'd be awesome in the second round. This draft, Odell Beckham is rated even better in the second round, so I took Jeffcoat in the third. I believe Jeffcoat will be drafted in the first round, but some team that picks around 17, 18, or 19, right around where Dallas picks, incidentally. He's bigger and just as athletic as Bruce Irvin, a former pick 17 undersized defensive tackle who transitioned to defensive end in Seattle. I see Jeffcoat as a typical pick 16. In a normal year, I'd say cool. But the truth is, every time I run these simulators, an amazing player falls to Dallas. So the players that are normal year pick 16s are ideally selected around like picks 20, 22, or in this case in the third round. So Jeffcoat is this year's Bruce Irvin, as I see it. If If Jeffcoat came out of SMU rather than Texas University, he'd have been seen as a lights out prospect. He had 12 sacks in 2013. Those are good numbers. If he had played at SMU and had three sacks against Texas Tech and then put up his remarkable combine numbers, you'd be like, holy shit, he has sacks in bowl games. That means a lot to me. A lot more than touchdown passes in bowl games mean. I guess I'm saying I'm warming up to Jeff Cote. In the fourth round, Daquan Jones was sitting at the top of my board when I picked. Very fortuitous. He's enormous and has proven backfield production in the Big Ten. I tend to respect blockers in the Big Ten and defensive tackles who wreck them. He's a 330-pound player with a long list of stops in the backfield. He should be Dallas' best one tech for the next 10 years. In the fifth round, my opportunities to improve the offensive line were gone. In addition to the skill players, Kareem Martin to me is a second or third round pick, but again, with this draft being so deep, he's there in the fifth round. He, to me, looks a lot like Jason Hatcher. Jason Hatcher himself was a third round pick. He's uh, 6'5", or maybe even 6'6", and he has an elite 40 time for his 285 pound weight. I want to groom him to be a 3-tech. I think he could be a great 3-tech. He also has the potential to be a good strong side end. He's a lot of length. Um, People say he's maybe a little thin, but since since he has so much burst and pop, uh, that's what reminds me of Jason Hatcher, and I can see him playing Jason Hatcher's role. Now, Jason Hatcher had a lot of success in our defense last year, but did he really have the success that we or the coaching staff wanted from him? Um, we saw the stacks or the sacks. Uh, he got sacks, but did he get pressures? Was he there consistently, or was he only there in spurts against soft offensive linemen? Uh, I kind of wonder about Jason Hatcher's productivity. It was great how many sacks he got, but I don't think he was very effective against the run. He was one of those linemen that was there when they gave up 40 first downs against New Orleans. So, I mean, Jason Hatcher was very productive in one statistical category. Uh, I don't think it's been verified that he was really productive in Dallas across the board at his position playing the three. Uh, But I'm still happy for him. Um, Go you. Uh, All right, so we're... Yeah, so if we got Kareem Martin, I'd want him to be like Jason Hatcher in our defense. I'd want him to be better against the run, though. All right, so that wraps this up. 
I've dealt with the cutting of Marcus Ware, the ambivalence of our defensive line, the signing of Melton, Melton the review of defensive linemen in their short shuttle times. Short shuttles can really help you see what edge rushers have to offer, and Dallas needs one. Here, at the end of this blog, I have three mock drafts run through that Fanspeak website. It's fun, but woefully inadequate for realistically anticipating reality. That said, each time I run the mock, I find fantastic players I can use. It's my experience that second round picks make or break Dallas' draft over the long haul. Is it an amazing, bountiful draft? Who was the second rounder? Dallas is sometimes not good here. In my mocks, I got Coney Ely, Odell Beckham, and Scott Crichton in the second round. Crichton is the only player I see as a realistic chance. This bodes well, though, for Dallas's fortunes. Having many good players to choose from is ideal, and the depth of this draft is having great players fall uncannily. Okay, last statement. I went and checked. There was a defensive tackle in 2013 with a 4.39 short shuttle. It's not like Aaron Donald is the first man to ever do that at 285 pounds. Overall, in 2013, there were six defensive line players at the combine with short shuttles below 4.4. .4. In 2014, there are nine. That seems like an insignificant difference of integers, but it is a 50% increase in the number of available players. Imagine that there were 100 good players in 2013. In 2014, there would be 150 good players. So the statistics are saying, um, or these sort of like difficult to achieve statistical benchmarks that, that players achieved at the combine suggest that there's 50% more better players in this draft than there were in the last draft. That's kind of how I'm extrapolating the data. It's uh, pretty anecdotal, um, but it's part of the the arrangement. I mean, everyone's talking about how this is a deep draft, and that's another statistical little uh, showing of how deep this draft is. There's a lot of good players, so I hope Dallas gets some good compensatory picks, uh, maybe even in the fifth round. This draft is deep enough to make them matter. All right, so signing off, and uh, thank you. Hope you enjoyed.